welcome to episode two of Raising Your Vibration. Um, starting with, I'm putting a beautiful scent in my home for the weekend called Vanilla Chestnut. This one is one of our fall scents from Scentsy. Now, have you ever, as I'm doing this, I wanna just kind of run a couple things by you. Have you ever wondered why we relive our trauma? Why do we do things that don't serve us well? And why do we stay stuck? in a pattern of doing things that clearly don't help us and don't serve us. And that's what today's about. That's what I want you to think about because what I ultimately want you guys to do is to let go of your trauma. And we all have it. We all have trauma. So pay close attention, friends. I want you to be able to release that trauma so that you can live a happier, healthier and more joyous life. So welcome to episode two of Raising Your Vibration. Good morning, friends. Welcome back to my channel, Southern Yankee. Um, I am in, it's 6.30 in the morning and I am getting ready for work. Um, I have to shower either tonight or tomorrow morning. So I am putting lashes on because why not? Sometimes I don't like to do lashes because it leaves a little like glue that's for me hard to get off my eyes. But since I have to shower anyway, um, and if you're curious about what I have on my eyes, I know somebody's going to ask. I have the Groovy Garden palette on. Um, I'll just show you. I don't have many. I have like three colors on. So basically, I have this. Where is it? This light green. This is called Sage Serenity underneath the shimmer on the whole inside part of my eye. And then I have this shade. Earthly Ember on the outside with a tiny bit of Hazy Dream, like a, like a dip. And then on the lid is my favorite, one of my favorite shades, Jazzed, um, here. So depending on the light, it's going to, look. I think what you guys are seeing is the green, which is great. Um, so I'm getting ready to put these lashes on, and um, I wanted to come on here because I was thinking, you know, I need to film the second video for the raising your vibration we did video uh number one which if you have not seen that go watch that um and this will be video two um and i don't have a lot of time so i was like all right you know what i'm going to do i'm going to um as i'm thinking about it as i have a few moments here and there i am going to go ahead and film snippets of it so you may see me in this video in a bunch of different settings um sharing information so the first video we talked about um you know what you're saying and, and stuff of, and i don't know i hope you did well with your homework but i um found myself a couple of times being like judgy um, watch this up on tv and making a snarky comment um, and I really needed to like rein myself in and be like, that is not loving. That is not kind. And that is, it doesn't serve my, my higher purpose. So, um, but I also had some moments where I also know that I was able to, um, really keep my, my thoughts in a very positive space. And so I want to talk a little bit about, you know, we talked about, well, we talked about like what you watch on TV and social media and stuff um there there I did a really good job I think of like turning things off that I don't think were serving me um you know some some stuff that I just didn't feel like I was jiving or connecting with or was just in general negative and I made the decision not to watch it now I did watch something that got my bug that that upset me this week Many of you probably did too. There's like a really long lash that needs to come out of here. It's like sticking way the hell out. Come out, come out. I'm going to have to cut that. Hold on. Okay, so I, I did watch something on TV that I, I don't think was a great, and the greatest thing that was the debate. It got me all jacked up, and then I was up till like 3 in the morning. And A, I try not to watch too much of the news, but kind of hard it's in your face all the time and I think we feel like the ending to the story of who gets elected is the be all and all to what's going to happen you know to our world and I know whether you're on the right or the left you feel very strongly about your opinion and what I've had to step away and realize is that the only thing that I can control is my vote and 
that doesn't mean that my vote is going to be what happens. Now, I think there's a purpose for all the good and the bad that happens in this world. And when I think about it like that, I think whatever is supposed to happen, it means that it's supposed to happen and we're supposed to maybe have, maybe there's a lesson in there for us regardless, you know, because I can't control a lot of that. And so why am I worrying about it? Why am I spending my precious energy, my precious time worrying about that? And you shouldn't be either, frankly. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, know that whatever is going to happen there is going to be divine um, intervention, divine on purpose for a reason. For us, whether it chaos ensues or, or peace ensues, of prosperity, there's going to be a reason we go through whatever it is. Now, I also think, and this might be a controversial statement, but I do think for some of you that aren't, um, haven't come into your enlightened spiritual side yet, I do think that there's going to be um, realities that are different for different people that are here. So what do, what do you mean by that? I think that we're, I think there's multiple realities going on at all the time, all the time. And that's why I'm telling you, like, claim what you want and stay away from what you don't. Because right now, guys, you do have the opportunity to sort of uh, manifest your reality that you live in. You know, um, if people live with doubt and fear and anger and resentment, and all those negative things that you could be living with, that becomes your reality. You've heard the term perception is reality, right? So um, if you live with happiness, joy, this is so stupid. Do you see what's happening? This thing is like a color pop and it's like in and out. And it's, that's why I'm having trouble with it. Um, <laughs> did it just fall out? No. Okay. So if you live with happiness, joy, good does positivity, then that's your reality. That's the reality I choose. And I'm going to encourage you to choose that as well. Now, if you've mastered, which I, I'm sure you haven't doing it a couple of weeks, but if you've mastered your words, or hopefully by now at least you've gotten better at what you're saying out loud, let's go into your thoughts, okay? Your thoughts shape your reality in such a big way. And I want you to really think about what your thoughts are. Because your thoughts sometimes are conscious and sometimes they're unconscious. The reason spiritual people can connect to spirit, to the other side, is because they're not using their conscious thought. They are opening up their chakra, which is your, your crown chakra, your head. And we have a direct... Um, a direct connection with source we always have there's no reason anybody in this world doesn't know that there is something greater and bigger and wonderful more out there we were created from something not nothing um, and if you if you open up your mind and you allow yourself to be directly connected to the divine then you'll be directly connected to the divine and that's why a lot of people get messages like myself in dreams the other day, I had a vision for my son, specifically my middle one, to, and I did tell him that to slow down during a school zone, like maybe he was going to get a ticket for speeding through a school zone. Now, my son knows this. He's 26 years old, my middle one, but it wouldn't go away. I kept getting the message. Maybe one day he's got his child. He's not paying attention. Who knows? So um, I let him know. And he's like, duh, mom. Okay. Okay, fine. Fair. Yeah. Like, you know, you're 26, whatever. I'm turning, not putting this on yet because you won't hear, but I'm going to turn it on because I'm getting ready to go in the car. Um, but I told him anyway. And we'll see if he has, if anything comes of that. And if he says, mom, you know, your, I, I, your voice was in my head reminding me. And I, I slowed down. And I think I would have gotten a ticket if I didn't. We'll see if that happens. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Now, I did have a dream 
back in January 3rd, actually, to be specific, January 3rd of this year, that my son, the same son, Grayson's mom, was cheating on my son. Um, the dream was so strong, and I didn't tell my son about it at the time because I was like, he's not going to believe me anyway. Um, I mean, I had details. <laughs> details from her side and from the guy she was sleeping with side. I wrote him down, and I dated it. I wrote it in my, on like in my journal on my phone. And then in like at my daughter's, um, everything sort of hit the fan with them. And my daughter, right after my daughter's bridal party, she went out and partied, Drew and her got in a big fight. I think a day later she slept with this guy. And then they broke up. And that was when my son knew about it. But that was not when it happened. I mean, it did happen then. That was not the first time that it happened. So, um... Why did that come to me in a dream and why was it so vivid? It was one of those, you know, you, you forget about your dreams a lot of times. You just wake up and you know you had a dream and you have a feeling about it, but you didn't, um, you, you just go on about your day because, like, you can't remember it. But this dream I remembered. I remembered it. And um, when I told my son, you know, obviously months later, I had, a, I had another dream about the relationship she's in now, too, which um, I've also written down, but I'm not going to say just in case she's watching this. Um, cause I want to just see how it plays out. Um, and that should be happening soon. So, um, I'll fill you in on what that, what that is. Um, uh, when and if that comes to fruition, I need a little bit of bling on the inside of my eye. So anyway, so your, your subconscious a lot of times will give you messages and, give them to you when you're sleeping so if you've ever had a prophetic dream and I'm really curious if any of you have um it's because your mind isn't taking over we overthink so much and don't believe so much and um you know it's almost like our minds get in the way when you can make your mind like a blank canvas and allow spirit to talk to you you'll get your messages and you start doing that by raising your vibrations, my friends. And so to raise your vibration, every morning I sing. Every morning I sing. Every night I sing. It's one of the, my favorite ways to raise my vibration. Other things that would raise my vibration, for me personally, this could be different for you as well, is listening to the birds outside and enjoying nature, is grounding yourself. You might hear, you know, what is grounding? That is like connecting with Mother Nature, connecting with spirit, and putting your feet and your hands in the ground. One of the reasons I think I love gardening, another really great thing is the beach because you get ionic, electromagnetic ionic waves um, that are very present at the beach, which is why most people are typically very happy when they're at the beach. And um, I love the beach. It's one of my favorite places. And I didn't know why it was one of my favorite places. And then I learned about these ionic, um, I'll, I'll link, I'll link something for you about this because I don't even know if I'm saying it right. It's been a long time since I've even read the article about it, but there's something that happens in the energy field at the beach that is grounding for everybody. And you're laying on the sand, right? You're laying on the sand, you're going in the water, you're going into nature and it's so healing and healthy for you. They even now are making grounding mats so that when you sleep, you can take advantage of this really wonderful magnetic energy that is out there. All right, I think I'm ready. And I love, love my eye look today. Do you love it? I do. All right, I have a little sweater I'm going to put on because it's chilly out this morning. Um, we've been getting some cold mornings, which is fun. We don't normally get that here in Virginia. Normally it's like hot mornings, hot nights, hot, hot afternoons. I love that we're getting a little chill in the air for fall. So, um, so I, I want you to think about, you know, what are the things that you think about a lot? What are the things like that you come back to that hold you back? Do you think you're bad at math? Because I did. All grown up. I suck at math. I suck at math. Well, that's what I told myself. So guess what? My brain believed it. You know, do you tell yourself you're good at something or you're not good at something? Do you say to yourself, well, I am this way because as a child, I went through 
my XYZ. Like my dad beat me. I went through childhood trauma. Um, my mom was sick. Um, and that affected me and I'm the way that I am today because of this. Are these things that you hear yourself saying to yourself regularly? So what are you telling yourself? These are thoughts that are going to stay in your brain and they will affect your every single day and they will rob you of your joy, your peace, and your happiness and your abundance, friends. Do you tell yourself that you're, you're always broke, that you are you can't get ahead, that you're Robin Paul to pay Peter? Or do you say, when you write your bills out, do you say, I'm so grateful, thank you for the blessing of being able to pay that, pay that or pay that bill off. Like, you need to change the way you're thinking on an everyday life. Don't live, this is so important guys, this is a pro tip, do not live in your drama. Do not live there. Do not relive your drama. Do not live in your drama. Do not tell yourself, I'm this way because. I will tell you a secret to my joy and happiness. I went through a very, um, and I'll get into this a little bit more in the video because I don't have time right now. I've got to get to work. But um, I went through a very difficult, painful childhood for a lot of reasons, okay? Um, my mother was sick, um, very, very sick. Um, I'll talk more about that later. My father was um, abused as a child severely. And in fact, my grandfather, who I never met because he died when my dad, my dad lost both his mom and his dad before he was 12. Imagine that trauma. And um, his mother, who I'm sure I would have absolutely loved and adored, um, had her front tooth knocked out from my grandfather. And my grandfather was an alcoholic. He fell down the stairs. I think he had a heart attack, but my dad believes it was from drinking because he was an alcoholic. And um, that really affected my dad in a way that I don't think he understood. Unfortunately, me and my two, two of my sisters really kind of bore the brunt of the trauma he went through because then he put that trauma on us and we were hit a lot, um, too much, um, eventually stopped. It's why I moved away. It's why I moved to Virginia. I didn't want my three grandkids growing up with that. I remember having a conversation with my dad when he started screaming at my kids when they were babies saying, do you want, do you want my kids to have the relationship with you that I had with you? And I think it stopped my dad in my tracks. Um, I forgave my dad a really long time ago. I love my dad. Um, my aunt had come to Virginia, his sister, this gets me emotional, um, and she showed me a picture of my daddy when he was a kid, and he was so tiny, oh my gosh, he was such a tiny little boy, just skinny, tiny little boy, um, kind of reminded me of my little boys, and she told me that my grandfather would come home drunk, and scream at him while he slept off his drunkenness and would make my father stand in the corner. Um, now, you think, okay, that's not too bad. But she said he had to stand in a corner for hours and hours and hours. And if he got out, he was beaten. And she told me that she would sometimes then go and like when he would fall asleep she would get in the corner and stand there in case he kind of groggily opened up his eyes just so my brother could go or so my dad could go use the bathroom and then he would get back in the corner again so he didn't get beat my dad endured beatings um, and so when I learned about that was the first time I was able to start my journey to forgive my father um, I, his childhood trauma affected how he parented me, and unfortunately, my mother's childhood trauma, which I know very little about, which caused her illness, also affected me and my siblings. There's five of us, and um, I've went to counseling, but I will tell you that it wasn't the counseling that helped me in my father's case. It was my aunt showing me the picture of him as a helpless little innocent boy. 
in a way that I connected because I had two helpless little boys at the time. So, um, and now they're big, capable boys that still need mom and dad. Um, so anyway, I gotta get to work. So I think I'm all ready. I think I have everything I need. Let me grab my stuff and I'll pop back in shortly and finish up with you. Okay. Um, to tell you that I didn't like my dad for a long time is an understatement. Thoughts that I had in my head at that time of my life and honestly until probably I was close to 30. Hold on. I don't have a thing that holds my phone this way, but so I'm just going to for a second so I can finish this segment out for you. Um, but the thoughts that went through my head back then were really bad, friends. Really bad. And I don't think my aunt knows that she sort of saved me and my relationship with my dad because... Um, her help, she helped me through that without her realizing it. I should probably thank her for that now that I'm thinking about it and let her know because, um, I don't know how my, I don't know how old my, my aunt is. My dad's 73, so she's probably 70 or 71. Anyway, um, it freed me. You know, they say that forgiveness is, I'm out of my perfume. I gotta sleep <clears throat> If I can order more of this. This was the snow perfume from Disney. And I'm out and I love it. So they say that it's healing for you and it was. It opened me up because that anger and resentment and even hatred at times that I had um, it was affecting my life in so many negative ways. Um, it was a it was a rebirth of sorts for me. And it allowed me, it just opened me up not living with all of those negative feelings is just healing for you if you can forgive but forgiveness is hard and I would never have known what was going to trigger that forgiveness for me but God did and he brought that into my life and he brought my aunt over into Virginia to show me and talk with me and um, that's what I needed at that time and he knew it and it just healed me it healed me right up and um, and it allowed me to while my dad is still living, to love my dad, to appreciate my dad, to appreciate my kid's father, to appreciate Robert stepping in as a bonus father to my children and being okay with that and, and loving that as well. And it, it gave me opportunities to enjoy my dad while he's still here. And when Robert met, when I met Robert, um, he didn't have a good relationship with his own father because his dad had like three different wives and it seemed to put more emphasis on his wives and her her kids or their kids than he didn't have kids with others but then his own kids his own kids felt pushed aside because of his father so obviously when I met Robert's dad his dad was very feeble and old and he seemed just like a sweet old man to me but I didn't live with him I didn't go through like wanting my dad and not having him there I mean I went through my own story with that and my own forgiveness but I think that helped me help Robert get over his we got to a point I pushed him and pushed him and he fought because he's a stubborn man I was like your dad's gonna die soon he was old he had broken his hip and he just was moving around slow and he had one time he had fallen and, and he was like in the ground on his in his own feces for like two days before somebody found him um, we started going over to see his dad every Sunday and his hands were all gnarled and he couldn't, he loved crabs. He couldn't pick them. We would bring crabs and Robert would spend hours picking the crabs so he could eat it. And he just loved it. And he, I think he so looked forward to us coming over there every Sunday. And, um, when Robert's dad passed away, Robert cried. And it was the first time that I had seen him cry. I'd been with him years and never seen him cry. And when that happened, gosh, my heart broke for him. It just broke for him. However, he told me something and I knew we did the right thing or I did the right thing in helping him forgive his dad. He would not have cried if he hadn't forgiven his father. Sorry, I'm backing out of my driveway. And, um... But he did. He forgave his dad. And because he forgave his dad, 
all that love came rushing back. So when he lost his dad, it hurt him more than it would have if he had stayed in that state of hatred and anger and resentment towards his father. And he told me, he said, you know, thank you. If it weren't for you, I wouldn't have forgiven my father. And I would not have had those memories that I now have with him because you pushed me. Okay, well, I am on tra uh, like almost standstill traffic. Uh, there must be a big accident or something here and I can't get over, so we're going exactly three miles an hour. Um, anyway, I'm gonna be late for work and it's all good. I messaged my boss like, hey, I'm in traffic, I'm gonna be late. These are things that probably would have stressed me the hell out in the past and now it is what it is. It's nothing I can do. This is something completely out of my control. Traffic, right? Um, but anyway, in a way I was able to help Robert um, a little bit. I don't think he's fully healed from the trauma he holds on to with his dad and his mom from his childhood. And um, it's not my full story to share, so I don't want to get more into it. Um, but somebody helped me with my trauma unknowingly, and I returned the favor. And karma is real, friends. So every time you put your energy into something positive and wonderful and good, whether it is you know, helping another person or um, doing something kind, um, helping an animal, whatever, you know, a quiet donation or, you know, have you ever been in line at Starbucks and been the recipient of, hey, the person before you bought your drink? I have and I always pay that forward. Um, it's such a wonderful, it's such a wonderful thing. Um, and if I can't pay it forward, I usually can't. If I'm in the line, I was planning on paying for it. So I can pay it forward. So, um, anyway, yeah, so, you know, I kind of got off track there, but karma is a real thing. But my point with all this was you don't want to live in your trauma. So, um, some of you have lost loved ones, moms, dads, siblings, friends in tragic ways. Um, it's so hard to lose somebody to death, right? Um, because it's not hard for them. They, they go to a better place. It's hard for us. It's hard for those of us that are still remaining here on this earth who now never get to see their face again, never get to hold their hand, never get to hug them, never get to tell them I love them. Like you can still tell them that you love them. They can still hear you. They're still around in spirit. They don't die, but you can't touch them again. You can't physically see them for the most part. Most of you can't unless you have uh, the gift of clear seeing and you might then be able to see them. But even then, most of the time grief blocks messages, um, which is why people are looking for a sign all the time. Are you there? Are you there? But they're in such a state of grief that that grief is actually blocking you from being able to connect with your loved one on the other side. Um, and it's important that you let go of a lot of the anger, the hate, the resentment in your family. Now our families, some families are volatile, right? Sometimes you do have to separate from your family because while you might be on a spiritual growth path, they might not be. You know they're not in the same place and if they're causing you distress or you're being abused then you do need to separate yourself and get away from that um, but if you if you have loved ones that you've lost I, I do have friends and I don't want to say any names again in case they watch this but they think this story can relate to so many people the anniversary date of your loved one's death do you celebrate their life do you are you depressed that whole day that whole week leading up to it um, are you not having Christmas and holidays and completely de shutting down because your mom's gone or your dad's gone or your sister's gone or whatever? Um, I will tell you, put that Christmas tree up, put a ornament up in honor of that special family member, let them know that they're there, celebrate their, you know, celebrate their birthday with them. Um, they will know you did that for them. They will know. And don't relive the trauma of their loss. But on those days where you're thinking of them more, change your thoughts to be thinking more of the memories, the beauty, the funny things that you shared. 
um, maybe write down a lot of the fun stories that you shared with your past loved ones in a journal. Um, we talked about making a grateful journal. So every night you go to sleep, you write what you're grateful for. And every day when you wake up, even if you're not writing it down, you could say it in your head. But in this case, with memories that you have from someone past, um, recipes that they made, you want to write them down. So Gigi is really the only grandma that I knew, which was actually my ex-husband's grandmother. Um, and I loved her very, very much. And um, I have one of her recipes in her handwriting in a uh, family cookbook. And I loved Gigi as if she was my very own grandmother. And I remember the day that we saw her in the hospital. She wasn't supposed to die. She was there for a surgery and on her legs. And she had diabetes and it wasn't healing well. And she ended up not feeling good for a couple of days and then we found out that she had suffered a heart attack and she was still alive and I went to see her and I had taken my three kids with me. Kenzie was the youngest, she was six, they were six, eight, and ten, the kids. And I knew Gigi wasn't going to come home. I don't know how I knew that, um, again it might have been just a gift. Um, I don't really know and she actually did say to me that day that she was scared she's had a, she had had a lot of surgeries in her life and she didn't she felt different she didn't think she was gonna come home from this one and they were in the process of transferring her to a different hospital that specialized in heart care um, she had such I don't know if it's because women handle pain so differently but they didn't have any idea till they tested her that she had had a heart attack um, Gigi lived through a stroke already, you know, she'd lived through so much. Um, she was 78, I believe. Um, so she's been gone a long time already because Kenzie is going to be 24. So she's been gone about 18 years now. Wow. Wow. And anyway, um, I still think of Gigi. I still love her so much. Um, I came across some pictures of her with my kids when, um, they were young and she always used to play card games with she always used to play card games with Mackenzie and um, Mackenzie saw her after she died she was six years old and um, she walked by Gigi's room and Gigi had this mauve recliner chair that she always sat in um, eventually I think my son took it and then I don't know what happened he had dogs and stuff I think it got ruined but it, I mean it was an old chair but it was in Gigi's old room and she was at her Nana's house and she came running up to me and she's like mom mom I saw Gigi I was like you did and I didn't because of the way that I am I didn't say no you didn't see her that's not real um, and I would encourage you don't do that to any little babies in your life that they see things they see things you know and it's okay um, they can see it because they are not jaded by the world we live in that's told them that you shouldn't see those things or that it's not okay to see those things so anyway so she came running up and she said I saw Gigi mama Gigi's in the room and I said where honey and she was like I walked by and she was sitting in her chair the chair she's always in of course, I couldn't see Gigi, but my daughter did. Now, when we went back, we went, I said, go show me. We went back, and she goes, oh, she's not there right now. But she saw her. And I would also find Mackenzie sitting in her closet sometimes, alone, talking. And I'd say, hey, honey, who are you talking to? And she'd say, Gigi. And I was like, oh. And I would ask her, you know, what are you talking about? And she would just, I'm just telling her about my day. And... She was very close to Gigi, so Gigi kind of stayed around for a while. Um, I, you know, she's closer, obviously, to her family. She's probably flitting in and out and visiting her children. I don't see her or feel her. Um, but then I haven't asked to see and feel her either. I think she came into my life because both my grandparents on my mom and dad's side of the family, I didn't know. I knew... Well, that's not true. I didn't know my, obviously my dad's, my grandparents on my dad's side because they died when he was a child. Um, I did have in my life my mom's parents, my grandpa, until I was like 12, but I didn't, I didn't really know the man. Uh, he was a very stern kind of military strict guy. I didn't really know him. Like he gave me a hug every time he saw me. He didn't really talk to me. You know, he talked to the adults. And then he was divorced from my grandmother, my grandma Helen, which I'm named after her. That's my middle name. And um, 
Uh, she died when I was like two and a half. So I don't have any of my own memories of my grandma Helen. I have the memories my mother has shared with me that she's passed down. Those are so valuable. That's why I say write them down. If you've got memories with lost loved ones, write them down. You know, I, I can't even tell you how many people I see that like they're, somebody dies in their life and then they, they just relive that drama and that pain of that death over and over. Or they, they feel bad because they weren't there when they died and took their last breath. You weren't supposed to be there if you weren't there. That loved one's spirit, for whatever reason, didn't want you there. Didn't want you to remember them in that way or see them in that way when they crossed over. That loved one felt like they had closure with you and they just wanted you to remember just the wonderful good stuff and not the bad stuff. Okay, I can see the accident up here. So we're all three lanes going down into one. So it's not, don't, don't beat yourself up because you weren't somewhere. Understand that the divine and that soul didn't want you there. You weren't meant to be there for that and be okay with that and spend all those to spend time friends right share the stories um you know their birthday celebrate them celebrate their life um celebrate their memories with your loved ones and keep them alive for everyone that you know still knows them and for those generations that will never meet that person okay so i know this video is a little all over the place coming in across several days to try to get it done but we are so so what i want to talk with you today a little bit a little bit further about as we've been as i've shared some stories with you is a little bit more about dealing with the trauma response okay so um and how kind of to let that go so i've taken like four pages of notes but i'm gonna cram this in in the last 15 minutes here so um the so let's use for example the loss of a loved one okay so um, some things that you can do. The first thing you have to do is feel it. Don't let your spirit sit with the way that the grief that you're dealing with in this moment. Um, we are not meant to fill our bodies with medications and alcohol and whoever knows what else to try to, those things are there to try to make you not deal with your trauma, not deal with your grief, not deal with your pain. And they have the exact opposite appearance um, effect. You might be able to temporarily not deal with it, but then that wears off and you feel like you need more because you're, you're feeling it again. And so you take more alcohol, you take more drugs or whatever you're doing and, or, or negative behaviors that you might be doing. Maybe it's not a physical substance that you're taking. Maybe you're doing something negative, right? Um, in response to it. Um, so that's not the area that you want to go to the, or the path you want to go down. You definitely want to focus yourself on the things that are actually going to help you heal, right? So um, you need to feel it. You need to, your body was made to feel this way. You know, my mom used to tell me, God never said everything was going to be easy. There are lessons in everything, even believe it or not, if you have something really awful happen, have happened to you, like sexual abuse of some kind or molestation, you a, have to understand, and I think at a soul level, you do understand this, that it was not your fault. Um, and I think where we get in the head, in the way is like, is using our logic in our head and trying to have a logical thought process. Like, well, maybe if I didn't wear this this day, this wouldn't have happened. Maybe if I had walked down this, this other, if I didn't go down that path, like I should have known better not to walk down there. It was dark. Okay, listen, you cannot beat yourself up about those things. What's done is done. You didn't have that. You didn't do this action to yourself. Somebody else did. Um, if you're dealing with grief or a loss, you need to feel that pain too. You need to feel it for a time, though. That's what I want to get through. You don't have to feel. All right, editing Terry here. We will see uh, how I do here because you're not technically on a tripod. But um, what I wanted to pop in and say is, when we're talking about don't beat yourself up um, for things that were out of your control. Um, I'm hoping by the end of this series as well that you're able to start to hear and feel your intuition better. Um, for example, have you ever been in a place walking around and got an uneasy feeling around somebody? Or were you ever um, late to work and then you get on the highway and you realize that you would have been in an accident that 
you had left on time, if you had left, you know, for work on time that day. Um, these are silent messages to your soul from your higher self, your creator, your guardians, and your angels, giving you a warning, trying to guide you to don't, you know, don't go that way this time. You always go the same way every single, you know, day to work. And then the next the, one day you just decide, I'm going to go a different way. And then you find out there was like, you know, a 10 car pileup on the way that you used to go or that you normally go. Think about Donald Trump. Um, what happened with his first, his first, it said, I never say that, um, assassination attempt. He never used that board, um, chart that he was trying to show, I think it was on maybe immigration or the border or something, I can't remember, but he never, he didn't do that until the end of his speech. All the time that came up at the end of the speech, and this one time he was like, let's pull, let's put it up now, and he moved his head in, at the perfect angle, just at the time when the bullet was flying by. Was that an accident, friend? No. No, 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 no. That was his intuition. He may not have realized it was his intuition. That was a higher power guiding him and protecting that man. 100%. So my hope also for you is just that you start to listen to your soul. You start to not worry about what your logical mind thinks. And you focus on your soul and how your soul is feeling. And that you begin to be guided in time by an intuition that not only do you have you have buried and put away. Some of you probably are pretty intuitive, probably have strong feelings about things. I was in um, Walmart one time and I had two men, I felt like two men were following me and they were, and I felt like these two men were dangerous, had, had ill intent, intent towards me. And I think they did, um, but I trusted and guided my intuition, which I'll tell you more about that story if you want. Um, but I trusted and guided my intuition and kept myself safe. And so, um, yes, you can't do anything about certain situations and they're absolutely not your fault. The only thing you can learn to do from this point forward is to trust your intuition and let it guide you. Okay, back to the video. Feel that forever. All right, but you do need to learn how to trust your own body's natural response to heal yourself and you need to work through some of that. Now, before we get started, you know, going a little further in this, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a therapist. If you've been through some traumatic event, you do need to talk to your doctor or your therapist. Likely they're gonna put you in some sort of counseling or therapy to help you deal with that. Um, and they may for a bit give you anti-anxiety meds. I don't find that anxiety meds work and then I find people start to abuse them or they take more thinking they need more and you know, worse things could happen. You could, you could end your own life doing something like that. So, um, but what are some ways like if somebody's lost, if you've lost a, a, a very dear, loved one? What are some ways and things that you can immediately do to turn around the way that you're thinking or feeling? Because you still have your grief, right? Like the grief is going to be there. It's like a weight that just sort of sits on your heart. And you might think of that person and every time you think of them, you start crying. Um, and when those tears come, it's okay. But I also want you to smile knowing that their energy has not died. Their energy is still there. And every time you think of that individual, that person is with you. Even if, and if you can connect with your soul a little deeper, your souls will connect and you guys will be, you'll be able to feel that individual, but you've got to get through your grief first. So, um, some different things that you can do, obviously keeping the memories alive of your lost loved ones, whether you're writing those things down or you're sharing those stories. I do love the idea truly of what I mentioned is writing the writing all those fun memories down because there might be kids or grandkids or whatever that never got to meet that family member that passed on early. Um, I wish I had known some more about my, um, like my grandparents and my great grandparents and things like that. Um, ancestry has been wonderful for that, that um, there were family members that I don't even know that I had that are related to me that did have pictures and stories and, and articles and things that I got to see um, with one of my loved ones recently that I never met, died, you know, it was, I think it was my great, great grandfather, died long before I was uh, even a thought um, in my mom and dad's minds. Um, so I love the idea of writing things down because I think say recipes, things, you know, things like that. And while they're alive, Make sure you're getting that stuff from them. Have them write some stories down. Have them write down their, their favorite recipes for you. Or, you know, um, I don't know, their favorite gardening. Whatever they're good at. You know, have them write some of it down for you. All right. 
I love this mug. This came from Hobby Lobby. I just love it. All right, so the other thing you can do is celebrate their birthday. You know, leave a chair at the table for them, bake a cake. I know my ex-sister-in-law, um, her and her kids, when her father died, um, it was before her kids were born, and they make a cake on her, their grandfather's birthday, who they don't know, but they have pictures of, and they have this memory with their mom now of every single year at grandpa's birthday, they have a birthday party for grandpa, and they sing him happy birthday, and they bake him a cake, and um, and they think about him at that day, and I'm sure that's a day that they share stories and stuff, or mom share stories with her kids about their grandfather. She recently lost her mother, and I know they're going to be doing the same thing. She's right, that was this year, she's right in the middle of that grief right now um, but I know she's going to be celebrating her mother's birthday and she thinks of her often and her kids do know her mother their grandmother and so those are memories they'll be able to pass down as they grow older and have their own children as well um, the other thing you can do is cook their favorite dish cook it make it for your family and make it a tradition to have it at every Thanksgiving or whatever you know and at maybe at Christmas time you have a favorite um, ornament or an ornament that has their picture on it or something that reminds you of them that you want to have a special placement on the tree each year as part of your new tradition. I have a blown glass uh, red cardinal ornament in um, remembrance of my friend Tammy who died way too young early 50s um, because she got sick with COVID and she didn't make it. They gave her a ventilator and she died and she was probably one of the closest things I had to a best friend here in Virginia. And I had given my friend Beth the very same orna ornament um, of the Cardinal. So we both have one. Um, I've been, I, I think Beth puts it on her tree. I put it on my tree every single year. Um, I do put it up high because of my kitty cats. I don't want that to break. I actually have a couple of cardinal ones in remembrance. Every time I see them now, I think of, about her. So um, those are little things you can do to keep the spirit alive and the energy alive of that person. And their soul is alive and with you in those moments. So when you do more of those things, you're bringing them into your home even more. They love it when you recognize them and that they know that they're not forgotten and they're with you in those moments. And so those are very special moments to create for yourself and your loved ones so that you can have that moving forward. All right. So, um, okay. Comment below. If you have something that you do every year for a very special person in your love, in your life that you lost, um, whether it's a family member, it's a friend, whatever, you know, um, if you have somebody that was near and dear to you that passed on to the other side and you have something you do yearly or something that you do to remember that person by, please comment in the section, in the comment section. I think that will help help everybody because we don't know what other people are going through, right, friends? We don't know if they just lost somebody today or yesterday or two years ago or 20 years ago and how they're handling that. So I think all of your comments below will be very helpful to the rest of the group with um, giving them some ideas of things and ways that they can um, change their frequency about how they feel and think. And in the process of doing these things, they're going to find and you're going to find that you are beginning to heal your grief. It doesn't go away. It's not like you're, you're going to, um, you're not, you know, you're never going to, you're not going to replace that person physically here. But when you know that you're drawing them closer to you and that their soul is with you, every time you're remembering them, it makes you want to do more of that, doesn't it? So in the process of doing that, your body will do what it's supposed to do. Your soul knows what to do. You will heal. You will heal, my friends. All right. So work on that trauma response and definitely comment below. But what if your story is darker? What if you were molested or sexually abused as a young kid? Well, how do you deal with that kind of pain and trauma? That's a whole nother level of pain and trauma. Um, unfortunately, my friend Tammy, who passed, dealt with it. And I found out after she was gone, she felt like she had no friends. She felt like nobody loved her, and which was the furthest thing from the truth. But I think that is coming from her past, that trauma she didn't deal with. So what if this happened to you? Because this can make you feel very alone. This can trigger or set off a very painful life. And that is not what I want for any of you. I want you to have a joyful life. 
So again, I just want to make the recommendation if you have some, something serious like this that you should go see a therapist or go to a doctor and talk to them. Not, you know, they, I'm going to give you some of my thoughts and my opinions on things of what you can do, but I'm not a doctor. Um, and so please, please take precautions in that regard too. So it's okay again to feel angry, scared, upset, lack trust, hate, hurt. Whatever your feelings are, they're yours. You don't need to drown them in alcohol. You don't need to drown them in any other substances. You do need to, you're meant to feel them so that you can function. Your body knows, your soul knows, and most of, most of all, God knows what you need to heal. And what you're supposed to, you know, and, and maybe there's, you know, there's not a magic pill for something like this, right? Like, this is a very painful and, and difficult topic, I think, for most people to talk about. And I have a my own little experience. It, it wasn't as bad as maybe it could have been. It was still traumatizing to me, but nothing like a full out, you know, sexual abuse type thing. It was sexual abuse, but not in the way that, you know, not in the way that some people are thinking. So I'm going to share that with you today because of, of you know, that, that affected me for a little bit. So, um, but God knows what you need. So you need to feel it. You need, you know, that this feeling is not going to last forever. Um, and that you'll be able to eventually move on. The goal is for you to move on in a positive way that lifts you up, that doesn't bring you down. Right. So, I don't want you doing things like, you know, asking, oh, why me? Like, why did this happen to me? Maybe if, maybe I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe if I had walked left instead of right. Maybe if I didn't wear this outfit. Like, understand that if you had something this serious happen, it's not your fault. You were a child. This was out of your control. So the first thing you have to do is forgive yourself because it was not your fault. So you never should have put the blame on yourself to begin with. 100%. If this is, if you're listening to this and this is you, if this has happened to you, I am here to tell you, it is not your fault. It was never your fault. There's nothing you could have done to change the situation. Sweet friend, it is not your fault. Do yourself the biggest favor and forgive yourself because it's never, ever been your fault. Okay. Um, you might've had part of your soul contract might have you might have known this was going to happen before you chose to come back to this earth. And what is a soul contract? That is for another video, but it, it could have been part of your soul's contract um, that you knew that this was coming. And there might be a reason that beyond anything that you're able to understand. Have you seen people where they like go through things like this and some people rise and they like create foundations, like they'll have like their loved ones murdered and all of a sudden they have a foundation to help other families um, avoid it or that are going through the same thing and just support them and, and lift them up. And they do amazing, incredible things. They take it, they take that awfulness and they reshape it into something beautiful. And it helps who knows how many hundreds, thousands, millions of people. You don't know. Like there's those people, right? And then there's the people that live in that dark deep dungeon of despair for the rest of their lives and it's always a well if this hadn't happened to me I would be doing this or I would have done this or I would have I would have been successful I would have been loved I would have been happy if this this one thing hadn't happened to me but it did and those people are stuck they are living in their trauma and that's not a place I want you stuck at or if you are I don't want you stuck there anymore and I want you to begin to heal through this process. So, all right, let me, I think I went to the wrong page. All right. So, okay. So that next step for you after you've forgiven yourself is to understand. So you're going to feel it. You're going to forgive yourself and know you had no control over it. You are, you're, you're not going to let it define you because why you have a choice. So those people that, you know, rise, you know, rise up at some point and they, you know, they're doing lectures around the world for other families that have went through similar situations and um, sharing their story. As painful as that story is, the more you share it, it's almost like it loses its power. And those people rise to the top and, and become powerful beings because they loved themselves and B, they made a choice. They made one choice. 
the people living in the deep dungeon of despair made a different choice and they're stuck there and they're staying there. I just don't want you to be in the stuck category. Okay. So, um, when I was, I don't even know how old I was. I was in high school. So probably between the ages of 15 to 17 at some point during this time, I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but so my friends and I had met um, we had met some boys. We were cheerleaders. I think they were football players on the other team. Um, the name, it was Sweet Home. Sweet Home was the area that they lived in. I remember that. And we met these boys and they were the same amount of boys as there were girls of us. And um, I think we went to a club or something. They had like cl dance clubs for kids like under 18, like teenage clubs where you just, you just danced and stuff. And um, we had danced with these boys, we really liked them. We had continued conversations after this and um, they were having a party. And at this point there was no red flags. We thought they were all nice. Like, um, but I was soon to find out there were red flags. Uh, so anyway, so us girls traveled, I think there were four of us. We all traveled to the party. We all found our person, right? We were hanging out with them and, and having a good time. Everybody was drunk when we got at this party and we were in an area that we were unfamiliar with. And there was one vehicle, I can't remember who drove. I think it, I think it was my friend Lori, but I can't remember. Anyway, um, so we all kind of like, it was a lot of people at this party too, a lot. And so we all kind of like, were not together. We were with our, our other, our guy friends that we were like flirting with and interested in, you know, doing things kids do. And, um, I remember having to go to the bathroom <laughs> and I said to the guy I was with, and here's, here's like how I've made this so insignificant in my life. Now I don't even remember this kid's name. I don't even remember his name. Uh, we tend to remember trauma because it was, it was such a strong response. We'll remember that more than like the mundane everyday things. And so I remember what happened. Um, but I had asked him where the bathroom was and he, um, he said, it's upstairs. I'll show you. So he took me upstairs and I, I go, went, go to go in the bathroom. I go to shut the door and he pushes the door in and he comes in the bathroom with me. And I'm like, what are you doing? I go to the bathroom. He's like, I just wanted to kiss you where there was nobody here watching. And I was like, okay, fine. So I kissed him. Then, um, I, I was like, okay, like I got, I really do have to go to the bathroom. And he kept that door shut and blocked it and he locked it. And in this moment, I was like, I'm locked in this bathroom with this guy. He just didn't leave when I asked him to leave. Now I'm starting to get a little fearful and I'm not crying or anything yet, but I'm like, get out. I got to go to the bathroom. And he proceeds to pull his pants down and tells me to get down on my knees. And I said, no. And he physically forced me and, or tried to, I was fighting. I was fighting at this point and I was crying and I started making a lot of noise. There's a lot of people in the house. So I started screaming, let me out, let me out really, really loud. So hopefully like my friends would hear or somebody would come to my aid. Nobody came to my aid, by the way. Um, there was music playing. It was really loud. Like it was a loud party. I don't know that anybody was able to even hear me. Um, so making it even more scary, I was quite vulnerable and I was really little. I was like 90 some pounds at this point in my life. And so um, I, I just kept fighting. I kept fighting. Eventually, I think he was worried that somebody was going to, you know, hear he's going to get caught or whatever. So he, he, um, opened the door and like shoved me out. Right. And so at this point I'm like, I'm leaving. I, I need to find my friends, but I don't know where my friends are. I've got tears coming down my face. Um, I'm walking all over trying to find my friends and, something else happened. So he now was with his friends and he, he, um, got them all to gang up on me. So I'm walking, trying to find my friends and I found one of them. Um, <laughs> and I, um, the, there were four of the guys and they kind of all got around me and blocked me and I couldn't move. And they started slamming their bodies up against me and it hurt. Like I was afraid they were going to break my ribs. And, um, I, I was like, yelling at them to stop and they were drunk and they thought it was funny and they were laughing, but I was actually really getting hurt. And my friends did see what was happening at this point and they grabbed me and they pulled me out. We ran out to the car, got in the vehicle and we took off. Okay. So very, very, very scary. Um, for me, I mean, I was just a kid. I was just a kid. And these, these, these guys were a lot stronger than me. 
Um, so it shook me up pretty badly and it made me afraid. It made me afraid of boys, afraid to trust, afraid to be alone with a boy. Like all of those things were there, right? So I had to deal with those feelings. I had to think through them. I had to figure out, you know, how to kind of move on. And, um, you know, what I didn't do is I, I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. I did, I didn't go down like any of those, those paths. I, I did feel those feelings for a while. Um, I never went alone on dates. I always drove my own vehicle. Um, I always went in groups with friends. Those, those were the things I did. Cause I, to me, that was like, I got to protect myself. And I just still did that. Like after I got divorced, I still did that. I still employed what I learned. Like that event cemented in to me that I needed to be careful. So, um, and eventually God brought somebody in my life that I could completely trust who helped heal me. And he was wonderful and it, it was all good. And, um, but I didn't close myself off forever. I dealt with it and then you, and then I moved on and I didn't want to let that moment define me. It did change the way that I did things moving forward to protect myself. So that's kind of what I learned from it, but I didn't let it define who I was or who I became. So I knew that I was valuable. I knew that I was loved. I knew that it wasn't my fault. Um, I learned I couldn't trust everyone. Um, I would say prior, I kind of had rose colored glasses. I was like naive and I, I, there's things I still am naive in, but, um, I, I learned I can't trust people and to be more careful. And I carried pepper spray, still carry pepper spray. I traveled in groups to parties, like I said. Um, and I, I learned that there was really wonderful people out there as well on both sides. And I, I, lastly, I, I prayed regularly to my God. Um, so and also dealing with your trauma and it raises your vibration. So, you know, it's acceptance is a higher vibration than denial. So you definitely do need to forgive yourself. All right, friends. So in closing, some of the things that I shared that I did are things you can do, but you can, you know, focus on what you can learn from the experience, take classes, self-defense classes if you need to, um, get some help, go see a counselor, talk to someone, don't keep these things to yourself because I think when we keep it in also that hurts too. So the more you can get it out and deal with it, the more you'll be able to heal. Set very clear boundaries um, for yourself and for others. Make sure somebody knows where you are at all times. Um, the address, the name, phone number, all of it, okay? And again, remember that healing your trauma will raise your vibration. It will not lower it. It's going to raise it. So I I know this video is a little bit all over the place, but I hope that that is helpful for you. And your homework is to think about your own things that you have to deal with. There are things that maybe you haven't deal with, dealt with, or think of things that you have dealt with. Either way, in the comment section below, if you feel led to share, share, because your story might, might help someone else. And we have a good community. Nobody's nasty here. I think everybody is helpful and supportive. Um, so if there's things you can share with others, um, I would encourage you to do that and uh, let me know what you think about this video and I'll see you guys all in episode three. Take care.